السلام عليكم We are going now to start the next uh, session, and the title of the next uh, session is the Challenges in Hematopoietic Steam Cell Transplant. I have the honor to present one of the eminent professors of pediatric hematology and bone marrow transplant, Professor Khalid Salama. He will going to present donor issue in hematopoietic steam cell transplant. And I'd like to thank Professor Dr. Amel Bishlawi for giving me this opportunity to attend this marvelous meeting. Thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks for all the audience. Uh, today we are starting to speak about something different. We are always concerned with the transplantation process, what happens to the patients, things like that. Today we can go through at the donor issues in hematopoietic cell transplantation. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation involves any procedure where hematopoietic stem cells of any donor and of any source are given to a recipient with intention of repopulating and replacing the hematopoietic system in total or in part. The first successful bone marrow transplantation was performed for a child with severe combined immune deficiency in the 1968. It was performing using bone marrow from his HLA identi identical sibling. In the 1960s, 60s, the discovery of HLA system occurs. At 68, the first successful transplant. At 70s, they started using transplantation for leukemia. At the 1980s, matched unrelated donors uh, were used for transplantation. And in the 1990s, cord blood was introduced in the transplantation process. The allogenic hematopoietic progenitor cell is an established therapy and, and strategy for many diseases, including many bone failure, marrow failure syndromes, hematologic malignancies, hemoglobin disorders, immune deficiency diseases, and metabolic diseases. What are the types of donors who can be used? A key part in successful allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is the presence of a matched donor and, uh, and a recipient for, um, uh, matched for with him for, for the human leukocytic engine, the HLA typing. We use class 1, A, B, and C, and class 2, DRB and DRQ. The C is not usually done for everybody because the B and C are closely linked on the chromosome 6, so they usually go together. So if you are going with a family member as a, don as a possible donor, we don't do the C class. But if it is unrelated, we should do the C class. The types of donors include matched related donor, unrelated donors, whether fully matched or one locus mismatch, umbilical cord blood donors, and haploidentical donors. The matched related donors, they are usually related donors and generally are siblings, most, most probably. Quicker less ex and less expensive evaluation than other types. Best clinical outcome post-transplant with matched related donor only available for around 30%. And this is the main problem with, with matched related donors. The children compromise the majority of these donors in our work. The unrelated donors, they depend on the presence of the registries. So the World Marrow Donor Association was founded, and it is the largest hematopoietic cell database. They list more than 30 million stem cell donors worldwide, and over 70, uh, 750,000 cord blood units, included from 75 hematopoietic cell donor registries in 53 countries, and 53 cord blood banks from 36 countries. Unfortunately, almost in the Middle East, there is no uh, donor registry. High resolution HLA allele leveling Typing for screening of unrelated donors has been associated with improved outcomes in transplant using matched unrelated donors. The donor availability with registries differ regarding the ethnic groups. That's because most of the registries are present in Western countries. So Caucasians will ha have the opportunity to find a, don a fully matched donor in 76% of instances. 
And if we accept a single locus mismatch, this may rise to 90 or 95 percent availability of a donor. But when we go to African, it's as low as 19 percent probability to find a donor in the donor region. The Middle Eastern and the North Africans goes in between. There is around 46 percent probability to find a fully matched donor um, in the registries and a 70 or 75 percent incidence if we accept a single locus mismatch. But still we need to have a registry first. It has its problem. The process of search and evaluation for a matched unrelated donor is very expensive and is lengthy. It can take up to four months to evaluate and find an unrelated donor. And also, it's very, very expensive if we don't have our local registry, because we will not be a member of the, the international registry. So we have to pay for everything. Umbilical cord to blood donors, at the time, they were the coming, coming hope. Now, it's one of the types of donors, just, just one of the types of donors. It's characterized by extended donor pool, decreased graft versus host disease, and it allows for one or two leucine mismatch. It has its problems with delayed engravement, increased risk of graft failure, delayed immune reconstitution, and unavailability of the donor for any additional donation, such as T cell. Uh, uh, giving the, the T-cell dose to the patient or giving a booster dose to the patient. Haploidentical donors include the use of mismatch at three of the six main loci. Usually it is done with a family member, including parents, siblings, and children. Equal availability of donors for all ethnic and racial group. Assessment can be quick and expensive. Almost any person more than 90% in K of cases will have a haploidentical family member. The donor used to be chosen depends upon the HLA type, the CMV status, better negative, the blood type, it's better to have same blood group, than the presence of donor-specific antibodies. If we have two haploidentical donors who are choosing, we should do donor-specific antibodies and take the negative one. It, of course, we do the, next, the donor specific antibodies in the recipient. If he's having antibodies against these HLA, which are different, we don't accept this patient as a donor. In the 1990s, this was the algorithm for transplantation. HLA identical sibling, if not found, we go with matched unrelated. If not found, we go with single locus mismatch unrelated. Then umbilical cord, and lastly, haplo identical. This has much been changed. Now, the, still the first uh, choice is the HLA identical sibling donor. But the second choice has changed. It's, it's ranging from the HLA matched unrelated donor to single locus mismatch, umbilical cord units used, or haplo identical donors. The haplo identical donors have moved markedly up in the algorithm. That's because of the new techniques like the post transplant cyclophosphamide used in preparation and GVHD prophylaxis for this patient. What are the sources of hematopoietic stem cells from the donors? So hematopoietic stem cells can be collected from different sources as mobilized peripheral blood stem cells. Mobilization will be done with granulocyte colony stimulating factor. We can take a just bone marrow and use it or the umbilical cord blood. Sources carry different prognosis for the patient. The best is the bone marrow and the peripheral blood. The bone marrow having adequate number of cells, low T cell content, and it needs all stuff, of course, to close, ma close matching, fast engraftment, and lowest risk of GVHD in the process of non the blood. The peripheral blood used is good, but it carries a higher risk of chronic GVHD. Cord blood has the lowest risk of GVHD, but it has a higher rate of, of course, uh, graft failure and delayed engraftment. 
We are speaking still about the patient. This is not fair. We are biased by this. We are always thinking about our patient. We spoke about, uh, 10 minutes almost around donor from the patient point of view. And this is unfair for them. So if we do that, we have two persons in the process of transplantation. We have a donor who is in general has no medical benefit from this donation. And we have a potential recipient for whom the procedure may be life-saving. When a single physician has the responsibility for both donor selection and the recipient care, his or her sound judgment may be unknowingly affected. We can, without being aware, we can push a patient who's not suitable for donation to donate his stem cells. And this may have a big bioethical issue. So let's go and concentrate for some time on the donor. Let's put ourselves in the place of the, of the donor's doctor, not the recipient's doctor. What are the risks for the donor? The child is going to donate his bone marrow. He will be exposed to general anesthesia with its complications. There is possibility of the need for blood transfusion during the donation process. Although this is a painless procedure, but pain may occur at the site of operation for a few days up to two weeks after the procedure. The return of usual activities takes about two to ten days. And if this child is going to donate mobilized peripheral blood stem cells, yes, there is very, very rare uh, incidence of severe side effects. And there is very rapid return to usual activities. But this process may require the insertion of a central line. May need, the patient will need to have granulocyte colony stimulating factor, stimulating factors injections for many days before the process. Side effects include temporary bony pain, muscle aches, headache, fatigue, and nausea. But are all risks? No. There will be some benefits. Although they are not direct medical benefits, but there is a generalized agreement that there is huge psychological benefit to the donor. It increases self-esteem, pride in donation, a greater sensitivity to the needs of the other, increased family union, and decreased jealousy, and uh, he may have more attention from his parents. The parents always care more for their sick child. If, this, if I do something very big for him, the parents will also sympathize with me. There is increased family union, as we said, feeling like a better person and increasing meaning and worth of life. A big issue is the donor's safety. As we said, he has no medical benefit, so he should not be harmed. Donor safety should be our priority. Careful medical examination and the full investigation should be done to ensure that the doctor uh, to ensure that the donor is fit for the process. And follow-up is needed for some time to ensure safety and health of the donor. Some authorities recommend, but this is not a must, that the assessment of the donor for medical eligibility should be done by a doctor outside the team caring for the recipient. That's to remove all the bias. Although serious side effects are very rare, one in 10,000, all measures should be secured to ensure safe donation process. So, the American Academy of Pediatrics published guidelines specifying when minors may ethically serve as hematopoietic stem cell donors for a standard transplant. First, there should be absence, absence of medically equivalent histocompatible adult relative suitable for donation. So if there is a young child as a donor and there is an adult family member who is fully matched with the, with the recipient, I take the adult, not the child. If I have two children, 
I take the closest age to the, to the recipient, or older. There is, should be an interpersonal healthy relationship between the donor and the recipient. Because the child should be willing to do it. Most of, of donors tell us that they are forced to donate. Or they are forced, convincingly forced to, to donate. Donation for strangers to a minor and their involvement in international registries are unacceptable. It's forbidden to let a child donate for unrelated donors. It's forbidden to involve a child in donor registry. Except for the cold blood donation, of course. The likelihood that the recipient will benefit from the transplantation should be present. This represents the need for a, curf for a, for a careful balance between the overall risk to the donor and the expected benefit both to donor and recipient. Lastly, parental permission and the donor assent, and not a donor consent, because the children cannot give consent, but children should be agreeing on the process. So, so a donor assent should be obtained. Finally, the donation of organs and tissues represents a fundamental resource for the humanity. Donation may represent a sort of ethical duty for all people. On the other hand, health institutions have a perfectly symmetrical duty to guarantee the safety for donors. Finally, thank you all donors and thanks for all the audience. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Khalid Salama. You tackle a very important issue, which uh, usually it is not uh, well seen. Thank you very much. And you <clears throat> actually uh, put the hands or your finger on issues which is very important and we should consider when we are considering uh, stem cell transplantation. <clears throat>